right, I think we can get started. <laughs> Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, my name is Konstantin Lebedev. I come here from the beautiful city of Prague in the center of Europe. And as you can see, I want to talk to you about web animations. Uh, but actually, before we get to this, I want to briefly talk about PWAs and their relation to the native apps. So PWAs stands for, for, for progressive web applications, and it us usually refers to web applications that are fast, performant, and provide app-like experience to their users. And I want to focus on app-like experience part. Uh, so this may encompass many things. Uh, the ability to install app on your home screen, ability to work with native device APIs, ability to have an offline support. But there is also uh, a notion of how application feels to the user. And it can be a little more difficult to, to define. To, to show what I mean, I want to turn to the application that I'm pretty sure everybody uses, Facebook, right? They have both um, native and the web version on mobile, but pretty much everybody uses the native app. Um, I'm just curious, is anybody using web version on the mobile? Okay, there is a couple of people, but <laughs> uh, usually uh, the difference between native and web users is just like words apart. And uh, to, to, to see why uh, that might be the reason, I want to show one simple interaction that people can do in the application. So we want to add a reaction to a Facebook post. When we do this in a native app, we get this nice toolbar that pops from the bottom, all the emojis are animated and alive. We get nice bubble animation when we hover over them. And this is what it looks like on the web. It works kind of the same, but it's a little laggy. It, it uh, lacks those nice finishing touches of the native app. And uh, there's more examples of this in the Facebook app and in other mobile apps. But the point that I'm trying to make is that even though both apps provide the same functionality, uh, the user experience that we get is totally different. And as you might have guessed, uh, animations is one of the parts that uh, creates the good UX. Good animations help us engage users, uh, support and reinforce their interactions, and generally give applications more polished and almost native feel. So in this talk, we're going to talk about designing and developing such animations. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to define what good animation actually is. So the good animation, first of all, is contextual. It helps explain things in a context, so it shouldn't be just meaningless and distracting. It should be short so it doesn't prevent user from performing their action in the application. And um, animations of 300 milliseconds or less is usually preferred. Animation should be interruptible, so that's if we, for example, transition from one page to another, and the, then the user clicks back. We don't want to wait for the whole animation to finish till the end. We want it to be interrupted and replaced with a new one. And finally, animation should be performant because otherwise if animation causes application to lag and work slowly, then instead of improving UX, we achieve the opposite effect. So let's talk about the options that we have uh, when animating in React. Uh, we'll start with, something, with uh, something simple such as CSS animations. So let's um, take a look at this sample component. Here we have a local state that tracks whether the component is active or not active, which is just the Boolean flag. Uh, then we toggle active class on the container div, and we render three child elements inside of this container. So the element looks kind of like this. So let's say first we want to animate the background of the container. Uh, what we can do is to define a new background color for the container when it's active, when it has active class, 
and then just use transition property specifying the CSS property that we want to animate and the duration of the animation. And we get something like this. We can make things more interesting and propagate animation down to its children. So first, we'll define the same transition property for the box element, so one of those three boxes inside the container. And when this box is inside of active container, we're going to change its opacity and rotate it 90 degrees. And we get this result. We can make this example even more interesting by adding staggering animation. We can use pseudo uh, classes, class selectors as nth child to add transitional delay property to the second and the third box. And this is the result we get. So uh, as you can see, with just a few lines of CSS, we managed to create quite a complex animation but it still looks very rigid and unnatural. And the way to fix that is by using an easing function. Easing uh, is a function that describes the rate of change of the animatable parameter over time. By default, we have linear animation. So, uh, the, for example, the color changes linearly over the duration of the whole animation. This is, uh, uh, it's not, it doesn't look very natural because nothing in real life moves in this manner. So we can use uh, easings like ease in and ease out where we have acceleration in the beginning and constant speed by the end or the other way around where we move at the constant speed and then we have deceleration in the end. Or we can also use a custom busier function where we can specify speed curve in whatever shape that we want. And, to, and uh, easings are very powerful because they help us create the illusion of things moving slower or faster. Uh, this is the example we've just created that uses linear easing. And this is the same animation that uses a custom cubic busier function. It looks more alive and it appears to be faster, but total duration of both animations is the same. This particular cubic busier function um, uses two important animation principles that I want to emphasize. And those are called anticipation and overshooting. So here I have a zoomed in version and that is running at our slowest speed. And as you can see before rotating 90 degrees clockwise, the box swivels a tiny bit to the left first and then it rotates to the right. So that's anticipation. And similarly, when it rotates till the end, it rotates a tiny bit more than 90 degrees and then snaps back into exact 90 degrees. And that's overshooting. And these two principles, they've been known for a really long time, since Walt Disney even before. And they help us create this nice polishing look to our animations. Um, so when we, you need to create a custom busier function, you don't really need to know all these numbers in your head. You can use uh, cubicbusier.com website where you can basically draw the whole curve and see how it compares to other types of animations. And CSS animations in general are very powerful. Um, you can take a look at this interaction that was created by a German designer Aaron Eicher, and surprisingly enough, it uses zero, zero lines of JavaScript, so it's purely CSS. And you can see it's very smooth, very uh, interactive. On the downside, it requires more than uh, 150 lines of very complicated SCSS, so you should always be aware of um, the possible trade-off. So to summarize, we want to use CSS animations because we don't have any extra dependencies to bundle, so we can keep bundle size small. Um, they provide simple but powerful API that can be sufficient for a wide variety of cases. And in general, they are ideal for a simpler animations, whereas as our animations become more complex, then we might take a look at the JavaScript animations. 
So we're going to do this next. Um, I want to mention two libraries that I particularly like, and um, there are two reasons for it. The first reason is that uh, both of these libraries are React specific, and it might sound like, like not a big deal, but when you deal with a generic animation library that doesn't know about React component lifecycle, you basically have to handle animation lifetime yourself. So you have to break it, you have to stop it, you have to rewind it. With these libraries, it's not an issue. Second of all, uh, both of these libraries support transient updates. And that means that they can animate DOM elements without causing the whole component to re-render. So they are very performant. And let's look at example to see what JavaScript animations can do. So we'll try to recreate this swipe to dismiss model. Uh, so as you can see, it's just like a model that pops from the bottom and then you can swipe it down. And if we swipe more than half of the height of the panel, it gets dismissed. If not, it just pops back in into its original position. So the structure for this is very simple. We just have uh, a page with the content, with an overlay div on top, and we have another div for the panel. Now let's look at how we might animate those. We'll start with the panel animation. Uh, I'm gonna use React Spring for these demos, and the way we animate things using React Spring is by using use spring hook. So we pass it an object with the properties that we want to animate, and we set the values that we want based on the is open state. So when model is open, we'll um, uh, fade it in from zero to one opacity, and we pop it from the bottom using translate y transformation. Uh, use spring hook returns a style object, which we then just need to pass to the animated div element. And animated div, it's pretty much the regular uh, HTML div element, but animated acts as a decorator, so it adds um, properties that are required for React Spring to do its magic. Now let's look at the code for the overlay animation. It's going to look a little different because unlike the panel that gets animated when it's already mounted inside the overlay, overlay has to be animated when it gets mounted to the DOM and where it gets unmounted, so basically when we show or hide the model. And for this, we're using a uh, use transition hook. Uh, the syntax and the signature for this function may look a little funky, but it looks this way because it's designed to work with multiple transitions and we just need only the one. But basically, we pass it is open property, which indicates whether we need to transition this element in or out of the DOM. And then we pass enter and leave property specifying our transition object. So when it gets mounted, we'll fade it in to one opacity. Otherwise, when it's leaving, we'll make it transparent. And then we just use the overlay transition object to render the same animated div, but conditionally, because we don't want it to be in the DOM if uh, is open property is false. And if we put everything together, we get this result. So it's not that much code, but we are almost done with our interaction. Uh, the second step is to connect it to the swiping gesture. And to do that, first we need to revisit the spring that we created for the model. Uh, so earlier we passed it an object with the properties that we want to animate. But it also has a different signature when we pass it a function that returns an object with the properties that we want to animate. So it looks almost the same, but the main difference is that as a result, we, we get a tuple with uh, two values, where the first value is the same panel style object as before, and the second one is a set function. And this function, uh, this set function can be called at any time uh, inside our component to animate either opacity or transform, and this animation will be 
executed independently from React uh, render cycle. So this is the transient update I mentioned before. So now that we have access to this set function, uh, we can use uh, another package called React Use Gesture, and we're going to define a new handler for drag gesture. And the logic is going to be as following. If we are dragging the object and the Y delta is greater than zero, so we're swiping down, we're going to call set function and pass it transform property where we use translate Y transformation with the delta that is equal to the number of pixels that we, that we moved our finger or the cursor. We also use immediate property uh, and set it to true to make sure that element doesn't get animated to this new value, but it, the, the value is applied immediately. So basically what we have is that the pan panel will uh, follow the finger as we move it. And otherwise, if we no longer drag in and we release the mouse or the touch event, we're going to simply compare the delta that we have against the height of the panel. And if it's larger than half of the height, we're going to dismiss the model. And otherwise, we'll just call the same set function and we'll reset translate Y property with immediate uh, flag equal false. So, so that the panel gets animated back into its um, designated position. And with all this code, we get our complete interaction. So everything works. Uh, so hopefully, as we saw in this demo, JavaScript animations really shine where we need a high degree of control over our animations. Um, there really ideal when we need to work with gestures because it's simply not possible with just CSS animations. Um, they allow us to animate things when they get mounted or removed from the DOM tree. And generally when we have a more complex animations, that's when we want to use JavaScript animations. There's a few gotchas that I want to mention. Uh, when it comes to React Spring and JavaScript animation libraries in general. And the first one is uh, about animating between units. So as you probably know, on the web we deal more with than just pixels. So we have viewport width, percent based uh, values. And JavaScript libraries kind of have troubles with this. So for example, if we want to uh, create a component like this where we have a, a div that has pixel based width and height, and we want to animate it to fill uh, the full width and height of the window. So how we can do this? Well, we can use the same uh, logic as before, where we have local state to track whether the box is expanded or not. Then we use a spring, where we'll set width and height to either percent base, uh, value or viewport based value. And we also have border radius just for demonstration purposes. And when we run this animation, we get this result. So the box actually gets smaller. And um, as you can see, the border radius animation works perfectly, but there is problem with, with hand height. And um, to understand the source of this problem, we need to know how React Spring and most of the JavaScript libraries, for that matter, deal with uh, between unit conversions. So when React Spring uh, wants to convert 200 pixels to say 100 viewport height, what it will do, it will parse uh, the numeric from value from the from value. It's going to parse the, the numeric to value. Then it's going to take uh, the unit from the from value and it will ignore the two value completely. So it will just assume that we want to animate 200 pixels to 100 pixels. And that is why actually the box gets smaller. So to fix this problem, what we can do is instead of using a VH value, we'll define a, a function that will 
convert uh, viewport based value into pixels, which is um, pretty simple logic based on the window inner height. And with this change, uh, when we animate our box, it will effectively animate from 200 pixels to whatever number of pixels the window height has. There is a problem with this approach as well, because even though animation will run as it should, the moment we try to resize the browser window when animation finished, uh, the box will overflow the, the constraints of the browser because it, do, it doesn't constrain to VH, it actually has still the pixel-based value. So to fix this problem, uh, we can use onRest function, which is called every time animation is finished. And when we animate to expanded state, we'll just set the height based, uh, to, based on the VH value directly. So what will happen is that uh, box will animate from 200 pixels to, let's say, 600 pixels, but at the end, the two value will be reset to viewport height, so the whole animation will run properly. Yes, and this is the complete example with both uh, width and height using custom conversion function, and the animation runs as it should. Um, the second gotcha that I have is uh, about transition property, and there isn't much to tell here. Basically, make sure you don't use it when you have JavaScript animations. Um, I ran into this problem when I was switching one component from using CSS animations to JS, and basically the animation that was supposed to look like this ended up looking like this. And it took me <laughs> quite a long time to figure out that I had a leftover transition property in the CSS. So be aware of that. Last thing that I want to talk about is animation performance. Because as we mentioned before, um, animations that have poor runtime performance, they actually impair, uh, impair UX instead of improving it. And as it turned out, it's pretty easy to impair performance when you work in a single-threaded JavaScript environment because literally everything can cause lag. Network activity can cause lag. User input can cause lag. Some heavy computation in the different part of your uh, JavaScript can cause lag. So it's very important to take uh, runtime performance seriously. Um, to make sure that we have the same reference of what is good runtime performance, we usually use a frames per second metric. And it uh, means what it says. It's a number of animation frames that we can request per one second. And 60 FPS is the, the ideal number that we want to go for. Uh, obviously, some fluctuation is allowed, but if your frame array drops significantly below like 30 FPS, then your application is going to have a lot of issues. To measure uh, FPS value, we just use the performance tab from the Chrome developer tools. So we fire our animations, we record uh, performance sessions for it, and then in this uh, panel, we can get all the information that we need. We can see all the animation frames that have been allocated. We can see how, how much time each single frame took to allocate. And we can also see which activity during a particular part of our animation took the most time to compute. We can also use this tool to find some correlations like this one. Here, for example, we have a huge dip in FPS and the green line indicates FPS. And we can see that it coincides with the surge in this purple area. And purple means recalculating uh, styles. So just with this tool, we can sort of identify the source of the problem and start optimizing. Um, I have a few tips on what to do to get the better runtime performance. And first of all, 
if you have elements that will be animated, but they don't accept any input from the user, then we can use pointer events non-CSS property, which will let, uh, which will tell browser to perform some micro optimizations under the hood. We can make even further optimizations by using a will change property, but it's important not to overuse it and use it correctly. So what happens when we use will change property, the browser will propagate the elements to a separate layout layer, so it will create a new stacking context, and that's a, a very expensive operation. So we should always be aware of that. And we should never use wildcard selector or all for the value when we use will change property, and instead be selective and apply it only to the elements and the properties that we know will change. Additionally, for optimal performance, it's uh, recommended to add will change property right before animation begins and remove it after animation finishes. So for example, here we have an animation on click, so it's a good idea to add will change property on hover. The most important and impactful thing that we can make to get better performance is to animate only opacity and transform properties. Um, and to understand why, we need to look at, the, at what happens when browser renders elements on the page. So it's uh, a three-step process uh, where during the first layout step, browser parses property like width, height, uh, top left, bottom, paddings, margins. Then during the paint step, it's going to apply colors, backgrounds, shadows, and border radius on top of these elements. And finally, during the composite step, um, it will perform transform adjustments using opacity and transform properties. So animating most of uh, CSS properties will cause browser to go through all of three of the steps on every animation frame. And that's a very expensive operation. But if we animate only opacity and transform, we, uh, the browser has to reevaluate only the last step. And even more, uh, first two steps run on the main JavaScript thread, whereas the composite step runs on a special compositor thread, which is GPU accelerated. And so it means that when we animate width or height, not only do we have to go through all of the three steps, but we also have to fight with the rest of our application for the time on the main thread. Uh, by contrast, when we animate only opacity and transform, uh, we don't take time on the main thread and the browser has to do less work. So that's why opacity and transform animations are the most performant. You can check uh, cssstriggers.com website, which has a list of most uh, CSS properties that can be animated uh, along with the information how many, which steps it causes to re-render. So as you can see, like even on the, on the very top, most of the properties will require all three steps from layout to paint to composite. So you can use it as a reference when you choose which properties you animate. And uh, sometimes it may seem that we have to animate properties other than opacity on transform, but it could still be possible to get away with just uh, transform animations. And I'm gonna show you a couple of tricks. So the first one is called a flip technique. And uh, <laughs> it actually has nothing to do with flipping. It's, uh, it stands for first, last, invert play. And um, basically what it does, it remembers the bounding boxes for all the elements that it animates, then calculates the difference between first and last position, so the beginning and the end of the animation, and then uses trans, uh, transform animations to play the actual animation. So let's see this on the example. So here we have a component that just renders a bunch of colored rectangles and 
the direct angles and the colors get shuffled. So right now they just switch between animation. And what we want to get to is this. So we can actually see the swap in animation. Um, so let's see how this flip technique might be implemented in React. So first of all, uh, when component receives props, we want to get the DOM node of the element that we animate. We'll get the bounding rectangle for this element and we're gonna save it in the local state. So basically we track bounding boxes for the elements that we want to animate. So then when we actually want to run the animation, we're gonna find the DOM element that uh, in, the, in its final position. So this is where it should appear at the end of the animation. Then we're gonna find the bounding box for this element where it was previously. We're going to calculate the deltas for this element to find the difference between X and Y. And we're gonna use trans, uh, translate transformation with a zero second duration of animation, which means that uh, when this element appears on the page, first it will appear in its uh, previous position, not, not in its current position. So with this setup, all is left is to request a new animation frame and cancel the transform, translate uh, transformation that we applied and give it some duration, like 500 milliseconds and the box animates into the position where it should be. Now, having said all that, implementing flip animation by yourself is really, really hard. So. <laughs> But most of the time, we don't really need to do this. And um, we can just take an off-the-shelf library that's already implemented. So there is React Flip Move that I'm using here. There is Re React um, Flip Toolbox. There is Frame Remotion. So a bunch of options. And when we use them, it, everything becomes a lot simpler. So we just wrap all of our um, rectangles inside of the container, give them a key so that it can track the elements uh, and their bounding boxes, and we get the animation pretty much with zero effort. Um, another technique that I want to mention is called scale counter scale. And this one can be useful when we need to animate uh, the size of the element, so width or height. So let's, look, let's take a look at this example. So we have uh, some container div with another HTML elements inside, and we use the transform height CSS property, as we've seen before in CSS animations, to animate the height of the elements. And so the animation looks like this. But we all know that animating height is very expensive. So instead, Let's try to use uh, transform animations. And to do that, we'll make a small adjustment when, where instead of animating the height, we'll use scale Y transformation. And we'll set transform origin to top, so it animates from the top, but it's not essential to, to this technique. And now the element looks kind of like this. So we, we achieved our goal. We no longer animate in height, but animation is obviously broken. So to fix this problem, uh, we can wrap the insides of the container that we had before into another container. And we're going to apply inverse uh, scale Y transformation to it. So we scale uh, the container by 1.4, and then we scale the inner container by 0 0.7. And, uh, actually use a slightly different value here to achieve this uh, interesting bounce effect. But pretty much we, we can get the very same animation, but without touching the expensive properties. Um, last thing that I want to mention about uh, testing performance is that uh, you should always throttle CPU on your laptops because like developers usually have 
top of the line MacBooks, but um, we cannot expect our users to, 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 to run our applications on the same high-end devices. So the very least we can do is throttle CPU in our Chrome developer tools, or even better, test on real uh, low-end devices. Second is uh, we should never test our animations in isolation. So if, uh, like we, we will only see the performance problem where the animation runs within the context of the whole page. Because even in the demos that I showed, when we animate heights, it looks okay. There is no performance issues. But if there is a huge block of HTML behind this element and browser has to repaint the whole stuff every time, then we're definitely gonna run into issue. So never test them in isolation and test them, test uh, animations in the context of the whole page. So uh, to wrap things up, some key takeaways from what I mentioned. First of all, don't be afraid to use animations. Uh, they create better UX for our users, so everybody wins. Uh, don't underestimate the power of CSS animations. There is uh, quite a lot that we can achieve by using just them. Uh, make sure to use custom easings or springs to create this native look to our animations so they don't look rigid and mechanical. And uh, use CSS for simpler animations and JavaScript for more complex ones. And finally, make sure to pay attention to runtime performance and test and optimize for it. Uh, before I finish, I put together this um, link for, for you if you want to check the, the demos. Uh, all of the demos that I showed, you can find there as a code, uh, code sandbox examples. So play with them to see how it works in real life. And uh, I think that's everything that I have. Thank you. Um, any questions? Sure. So the question was, uh, like sometimes we need to animate with a height that change the layout so we cannot use the transform animations. Uh, in this case, we need to get more creative and uh, you can create an animation that looks kind of visually the same, but it avoids the width or height animation. For example, um, if you have like an expanding accordion that pushes a lot of content to the bottom, instead of animating the height, you can set the height immediately to the element, but then use translate Y transition to kind of pop in the content from the bottom. And you can use the same logic for, let's say, search inputs that expand and move things aside. So you take the whole space with, without the animation, but then you use uh, translate fade-ins to, to make it look more, more natural. So you shouldn't never make You should really try to avoid this, yeah. I mean, in the end, it will depend on the, on the application that you have. It's a very simple UI, there is not much moving parts. I mean, not much HTML to re-render. Then it can be totally fine to animate width and height. But yeah, make sure to check, uh, to test it on the low end devices and see if you run into performance issues or not. Yes. Do you use just for a bit of group? And if you go uh, in text, what do you use mm -hmm. instead of the best uh, animation? Yeah, so usually you want, the question is, uh, where, when do you want to use a React Transition Group? And a React Transition Group is basically a JavaScript library that allows you to apply CSS animations for elements that you for the animations when you mount or unmount elements. So 
As I mentioned, it's the part that you can handle with the JavaScript animations, but you can also do the same with React Transition Group. Um, the question usually is if you want to bring this uh, extra JavaScript dependency to run these sort of animations, you should probably see how it compares to like React Spring because maybe it, it makes more sense to bring a slightly, slightly, slightly larger library but gets a lot more uh, benefits and like ways to use it in the app because React Transition Group it's kind of uh, very limiting, yes. Anybody else? Okay, I guess that's that's it. Thank you.